Today I'll be showing you 10 tips and tricks that I wish I knew when I started using Godot. Getting right into it, we have number one, and that is whenever you add a collision shape, for example, I'm gonna add a rectangle to this character, but scaling this to fit our sprite here is really tedious, and we can make this process a bit easier by holding down Alt and dragging from the corner, and that's gonna scale the entire box symmetrically. Now the next tip is for fonts. Typically when you're rendering very small text, it tends to get really pixelated and very hard to read. So the easiest way to fix this is actually navigating to your font file. And if we double click, it will open up the font importer and we just need to check multi-channel sign distance field. And mainly what that does is keep the font looking its best at smaller values. So if I click on re-import and then we run this again, it's a bit hard to notice with this example, but you can see that the font is a bit more readable. Now, when you're making a game, if it's a 2D game, you typically don't want all of the 3D nodes and assets that Godot provides by default exported with your final project. So what you can do to actually disable that is go up to project, go to the tools section, and open this engine compilation configuration editor, which is a very long name, but inside of here, you can basically disable nodes. So if I wanted to disable all of the 3D engine, I could literally just uncheck this. And then when I export the project, it won't come with all that 3D bloat. Now the next tip is to sharpen your brain. And this doesn't relate only to Godot, but game development goes a lot smoother when you know topics like math and how code works. And what better way to actually learn those topics than with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Now, Brilliant is an amazing online learning platform that focuses on helping you learn things like math, science, and programming. They have a ton of engaging courses that are actually super interactive, which makes it a lot easier to understand what you're being taught than if you were to like listen to a traditional lecture or something. Now, on top of that, you'll also get daily problems to keep your brain refreshed, which in my opinion, that's pretty good because consistency in learning is obviously the key to actually retaining the information. Now, I typically like to get like 15 to 20 minutes of brilliant learning in each day so that I can continue with the courses that I'm going through. And because they have a mobile app, it's super easy to just boot it up quick while I'm making breakfast or something and get a super convenient, quick little brilliant learning session in. Now you can try Brilliant completely for free for a full 30 days. If you head over to brilliant.org forward slash Kubel, or you can scan the QR code, which is somewhere on the screen. I probably put it like right there. So you can do that if you want. There's also a link in the description if you'd rather do it that way. Now, in addition to that, if you sign up for a full year with my link, you'll also get 20% off your order. Anyways, thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Now on to the next Godot tip. Now the next tip deals with debugging. So I know a lot of people still use print statements all over the place for debugging, and usually that's still really helpful, but there's another really powerful aspect of that, and that is gonna be using breakpoints. So basically inside of my code at any line, I can add a breakpoint, and that's just this little red icon on the left side of the line numbers. And the shortcut to this is also F9 to add or remove the breakpoint. But what this means is when Godot runs this code, it's gonna stop before it runs the line that the breakpoint is on. So let's say I put my breakpoint in in the apply knockback function. Running my game, if I try to knock back my enemy, it's going to stop the code at this point. And in the bottom panel, it gives me all of the information about my game at this specific frame. So I can see the functions that were called to actually get to this point and all the current values of the variables inside of the script. And something that not a lot of people talk about, you can also hover over any property and it's gonna show you the current value of that property. If I hover over my knockback direction, it's gonna give me the vector so I can kind of look through my code and see all of the current values, which is super nice. And then if I wanna move forward from the breakpoint, I can either hit the continue button right here, or I can step over each line, essentially line by line through the code. So let me just step through here. We go to the next line. Uh, we go to this next line here, and this is gonna be spawning in the hit effects. And I can kind of just like move through my game frame by frame and figure out exactly what is going on, which is a super helpful part of debugging. Now getting back to some simpler ones, you guys know that you can hit control P to open the quick select resource, which basically lets you search for any file in your game. I use this all the time to just open scenes quickly or whatever, but there's a few more that are really helpful. So control shift P is gonna open the command palette, which allows you to do various commands that are built into the Godot engine, even things like opening the Godot forum, which is kind of cool that's in there. And then we also have control alt O, which is quick opening, but limiting the search to only script files. And then control shift O is gonna do the same thing, but obviously limit this 
to just scene files. Now back in some more scripting stuff, a cool feature I just found is the bookmark functionality. So this obviously works better with like longer scripts, but if I hit control alt B, it's gonna make a bookmark in my script. And let's say I had like two of these here, you can hit control B or control shift B to navigate between bookmarks. So if you're working on a couple places in your script, you can just jump between them really quickly, which is kind of fun. I typically use the mini map, but any tips to speed up your productivity are always fun. Similarly to this, you can also make code regions. So think of it as just a section that you can collapse. So if I wanted to put like my variable and my function inside of a collapsible region, I would say hashtag region and then give the name of it. So we'd say like, uh, I don't know, example. And then I'd go to the place where the region would end and simply type hashtag end region, and that's all one word. And now I basically just have a drop down arrow for this entire section, which is also a great way to speed up your coding speed. While we're on the topic of speeding up your coding, the quickest way to delete a line instead of selecting the entire thing is just to put your cursor on it. Hit control X, I use this all the time. Now this next one, some of you may know about, it's the addition of UID files in Godot 4.4. So if you are on a version of 4.4 or later, you're gonna be able to use this feature, which I absolutely love. So basically when you're you're loading in a scene, you're typically using the path to the scene. And I really dislike this because if the name of the file changes or the location of the file changes, you're gonna have to go into all the scripts that reference the path and update them. But because we have UID files now, which is basically a unique identifier for every file, I can find my scene file, right click and say copy UID. And then by pasting the UID instead of the path, I will never have to update my code. So I can rename this file and move it around in inside of my file system without worrying about this path breaking because this will always refer to the same file. And a lot of people get concerned about like, this isn't human readable, like they can't actually know what this file is anymore. So if that's the case, literally just hover over the string. Um, it shows you exactly the path to it. And you can also show in file system or just open the file directly. So definitely something I'd recommend getting used to. Now this next tip is something I really like and I don't see enough people using it. And that's basically this code snippet right here. So looking at this really quick, we can see that we basically just have a Boolean variable, which we don't really have to worry about right now, and a test variable. Now we're gonna set test to 10 if our Boolean is true. Otherwise, we're gonna set it to five. So just doing that basic functionality takes four lines, and I think that's a lot. So you can actually compile this into one line and still have it look pretty good by saying var test and putting our if else into the assignment line by typing it more like var test equals 10 if my bool, so if true, else five. And just like that, we've compiled this all into a single line right here, so we technically don't need this. We're gonna do control forward slash to comment it out. And in my opinion, this is still totally readable, and I think the use case is a bit more niche, but definitely a really cool trick to have in your toolbox. Now, on the topic of people doing things the wrong way, and I'm unfortunately gonna call out some of you because I see this all over the place, and that is getting a random element from an array. So if you know, you know, but this is not a great way to do it. And like I said, I still see this all over the place, and that's basically using the randi range function and getting a range inside of the array from zero to the size of the array, minus one, obviously, for the index. But if you are doing this, delete this entire part and use the pick random function, because this is a thing and hardly anybody knows about it, but there's a function to pick a random element in the array. So if you don't know about this, this will make your code much more readable and a lot more efficient. So definitely pick random, like we gotta start using it. Please guys, please. And finally, we have a more advanced one, but it's still kind of cool. If you go to project settings and head down to the debug section, go to settings, we have this verbose standout option. And if you enable this, it's basically just gonna print more information to the output. So things like when your files are being loaded, and it also tries to print like memory leaks and stuff. So let me actually show this. If I run my game, you can see my output's gonna look a bit cluttered because I do have some print statements inside of here, but it will basically print that we loaded all of these resources. So it can get a bit cluttered sometimes, um, especially if you're doing a lot of different processes, but it's obviously cool to know that it exists because you can get a lot of information about your game uh, just by enabling this, this extra print feature.
Anyways, though, that's it for this tips and tricks video. If you want to watch another one of these, I have like a ton more. I think I have like four or five others. So I'll link those below. It'll be in a playlist as well. But I hope you guys learned at least one or two new tips and tricks. I always try to find some of the more interesting ones. But if any of you want to share a tip or trick that you have that you'd like to put in one of these videos, leave it in the comments and I'll try to add it to the next video in this series. Also, I'd like to give a quick shout out to all the channel members. You guys are awesome and your support is super appreciated. So thank you again. But with that, thank you for watching the video. I hope you guys have a good rest of your week and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.